BVS. Dr. Seth, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Manish. Manish, thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, really fascinated listening to, I think it was a Dr. Nathan's case. And uh, this is going to be fairly boring in front of his uh, <laughs> exciting uh, bailout. Not at all. I we're think I'm in the wrong session. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're <laughs> delighted to have you, and uh, we have yeah, uh, about I wish 100 I could positions. Have... Delighted to be there, delighted to be there. And uh, I'm interrupting the nightmares in the cat lab. Well, this is not going to be a nightmare. Uh, let me just uh, come to you with the tips and tricks of uh, to get the best outcomes of BVS. Uh, we've, uh, I know that BVS has now been approved uh, in the United States, available to you in your hands, and of course to many of the physicians who are in the audience there. Uh, so we're going to talk about scaffolds in general and just get the hang of uh, how we get the best results, uh, almost similar to that of the third generation metallic thin strut uh, drug eluting stents. So we realize that uh, in its present iteration, BVS is a, is a thick strut device. And uh, the absorb BVS itself is 155 microns. The other ones around the corner are also fairly thick strut devices, uh, apart from the MIRAS, uh, which uh, Merrill Life Sciences has innovated and uh, invented to be a 100 micron device, which is quite credible and commendable. So uh, the BVS as it stands now, and of course the most available commercially used device in more than 100 countries and now FDA approved is the absorb BVS itself uh, with the largest amount of data and large pivotal randomized trials in its favor. So, the, but, but it's not a stiff device, it's, it's a plastic device and, and you can actually see this uh, uh, right angled uh, LED, that curve, uh, pretty much a, a right angled curve there uh, with a 3.5 into 28 millimeter BVS maintaining the curves spectacularly and so is this acute angle bend in the RCA, which maintains its curves beautifully, even after acute implantation. And obviously, this, I, this, these guys had angiograms done in a time frame of one to two years. And by that time, of course, the BVS is much softer, and these curves are expected to be maintained. So it's actually a fairly malleable device. It doesn't straighten out vessels, and it doesn't straighten out curves, which perhaps reflects some of the advantages of this device as opposed to metallic stents, which would straighten out these bends and curves and create trauma as well as, as tension points at the edges. Now, what are the types of cases uh, for these de this device? Well, I'd say that, uh, of course, in the Absorb 3, uh, where some of you had experience, or in routine life, these represent usually simpler cases like a proximal LED, easily covered by a 28 millimeters or RCA single vessel disease, straightforward lesions. Uh, let me just go back to that slice. So, uh, yeah. So, and, 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 and of course, of course uh, some of these OMs and, and, and distal LEDs. But really, actually, this is practically what 10 to 20% of our patients are all about. Because most of the patients fall into some real world complexities like diffuse lung disease, calcified lesions, uh, bifurcation lesions, ugly bifurcation lesions, perhaps a 011 left main disease. And then you have a young guy with a 45-year-old guy with a long osteoproximal LED right from the osteum itself. So I think we've got to gradually uh, understand that perhaps the best, uh, uh, best bang for the buck does not lie in these discrete lesions in young individuals, but perhaps in the more complex lesions in a variety of patients which is the real life patients, perhaps diffuse disease and long lesions, uh, bifurcations, automatic thought process, uh, osteal lesions, why not? Uh, uh, and, and therefore, uh, I would actually say that while in your initial practice, you get used to the device by using the, the simple lesions in a younger age group, perhaps the first timer, de novo lesions, non-calcific, you graduate, graduate into more complex bifurcation, diffuse disease, angulated tortuous anatomy, um, and why not all age groups, especially elderly, who on a prolonged antiplatelet therapy would actually may have a greater need for a withdrawal of antiplatelets where they have to have a fall or bleed at any stage in their elderly lives. 
uh, even people who had previous metallic implants, why give them more, more metallic implants? Why not give them more absorbable implants so that they don't increase their metallic load within the coronary arteries and perhaps metallic sandwich for an instant restenosis is not the best option and perhaps a plastic sandwich could certainly be a valuable option and needs to be investigated further in registry data. Now let's get back to, let's not get into the arguments of why not and why, but I must say that it's back to the basics with this device. It's a thick strut device and we need to take this forwards in the best possible manner as we understand it. We now have an experience of more than 2,000 implants, or close to 2,000 implants with this device in, in close to 1,400 patients and uh, a majority of the lesions have been complex and in a variety of settings. Uh, so let's say, what is the lesion selection? Uh, uh, and what would I say you should not be doing? Well, heavily calcified lesions is perhaps n not, I would say not a no-no because I do a fair number of heavily calcified lesions, but I think it still remains to be proven as to the benefits versus risk in this set subgroup of patients. Uh, excessive tortuosity, I'm not against excessive tortuosity, I've shown you that, but excessive tortuosity with calcification is a no-no. It's a very difficult to get this device down, tortuosities with calcification on the bends. Left main, I still say it's a no, uh, because most of the left mains, I believe, should be 4.5 millimeters in diameter, and this device does not get to a 4.5. The maximum you can expand it is 4.2, so there's going to be an apprehension regarding, uh, regarding uh, stent apposition. Uh, major bifurcations, this does not fall in my criteria as, as a no. I think in the early stages you should avoid major bifurcations, but for me, I think it's a great science for bifurcations. Uh, it uncages the side, side branches in period of time, and one just needs to actually have uh, learned the tips and tricks over a period of time to do a good job at the bifurcations with this device. Obviously, without without uh, trauma or, or, uh, or disruption of the device. Uh, restenosis, I, I think it's a good idea to do restenosis and maintain a registry of restenosis. I have some great, great images of restenosis treated by this device, uh, or drug eluting stent restenosis treated by the device, maintaining patency at three years by the time the absorb is disappearing. Bypass graphs, I agree, the, not much to choose in that. Uh, these are degenerating vein graphs better treated by a metal stent till another lesion comes up. We all know that we've got to inflate this device slowly, two atmospheres every five seconds, and I say that both for absorb as well as for MIRAS 100. Although the MIRAS 100 structure is slightly different from the absorb and perhaps more tolerant, um, we still follow the same principles at the moment in the first in-man study with the MIRAS 100 as well, uh, though I believe that it's more tolerant and we would perhaps do far better things once the device is approved. Uh, certainly on the bench testing, it behaves slightly differently and has certain advantages. Uh, so prolonged inflation over 30 seconds at a maximal pressures. Uh, so therefore it takes approximately 45 to, to, to uh, a minute to implant this device. And then I would come to the other assessments of this. So here are my seven mantras to achieving the best success with this device. And my seven mantras go into good guide catheter support. Remember, it's a thick strut, large profile device, almost like a first generation of uh, metallic drug eluting stents, or for that matter, a first generation of metallic stents. And therefore, th th it needs good guiding, prefer seven French for most lesions, unless it's a straightforward proximal uh, vessel disease. You never know when you get caught at a curve where you need a better support. So, so commonly, seven French guiding catheters, you're able to do more. This device occupies a large space within the catheter itself. Uh, adequate wire support, and I often use uh, BHW or an extra support wire, uh, especially if there's a tortuous anatomy, especially if I see calcifications, and quite often in calcified tortuosities, I would use an upfront buddy wire to deliver this device. It actually spares you the agony of withdrawing the device and then doing other things when you could actually deliver it upfront, provided you examine the lesion and the path up to the lesion far more carefully. Uh, so again, the same principles as just large uh, strut, uh, high-profile, first-generation 
very limiting stance, like the cipher, for example, or like the, like the taxes. Uh, so it's pre this, these three, the three, four, five, are perhaps the most important of the seven mantras. Prepare the lesion well, which means predilate the lesion. And I actually say predilate the lesion with a shorter size, a shorter length, non-compliant balloon, which is near optimal. And I don't go for an optimal, I must say. I believe that I create more dissections which extend upstream and downstream when I do it with an optimal size balloon. So I go with a quarter size, smaller balloon that, than the angiographic assessment and then go up to 18, 20 atmospheres by which I know that I'm still within the realms of the vessel diameter and don't cause extensive dissections and but yet they have, have very little residual stenosis. So pre-dilate, high pressure, shorter non-compliant balloon, uh, 16 to 20 atmospheres till there's no waste. Near optimal size balloon. Appropriate, okay, the vessel sizing is, uh, is important. Uh, and that you can do by uh, believing that what you angiographically see is slightly undersized uh, by a quarter to a half millimeter, which is the normal case. You can do that by OCT, in which case you will get some optimal sizing of the vessel. And I was always overestimates the vessel to an extent. But you can also do that by a pre-dilatation balloon. So once you do that, once you dilate the vessel, you get an idea of the balloon as well as the vessel size. But it's important to get that appropriate vessel size because the device cannot be expanded to quarter five, it's only 0.5 millimeter higher than the, the, the device size itself. So a three can only go up to a 3.5 millimeters and a four can actually go up to a 4.2 millimeters. Though you have this 3.7 for a three millimeter so keep that in mind, and, and you don't have a lot to play around with once you've chosen the size of the device and the vessel size. So that's got to be accurate. And clearly, for me, the most important part of this three uh, most important mantras is number five. I certainly believe in this post dilatation with a non-compliant balloon, which is a quarter size higher than your visual or the scaffold that you've implanted to 18 to 20 plus atmospheres and yet staying within the expansion limits of the balloon. So 3.5, 3 millimeter scaffold can be dilated with a 3.5 millimeter non-compliant balloon to 24 atmospheres without the risk of disruption because you're in the constrained vessel. Uh, so that I think is important. Yes, OCT and IBUS, I do believe they're important. It's been important in perhaps your learning curve with the device gets you to understand that what you angiographically see is lesser than what the vessel is and that you really need to keep going a quarter or a half size higher in terms of your post dilatation in many of these vessels which you think are optimally sized. Uh, and then by the time you start understanding that, yes, you need to use it in your 10, 10 to 15 percent, 20 percent of your cases in the real complex ones, maybe bifurcations, two st scaffold strategies, long diffuse disease and so on and so forth. Uh, I actually emphasize this very important point. Much of the, much of the laxities of antiplatelets and anticoagulation on the table results in, in scaffold thrombosis. These are thick strut devices. Pay attention to antiplatelet regimen. These patients should be pretreated with clopidogrel prior to coming on the table. And if they're not pretreated, then it is the new P2Y12 inhibitors which should be used for treatment on the table so that antiplatelet inhibition comes in faster and more predictable uh, than clopidogrel. I uh, would measure ACTs very regularly on the table while implanting multiple of these devices. And actually, that for me would be at least a year of dual antiplatelet therapy at follow-up. And with multiple scaffolds and complex lesion subsets, including bifurcations, I would continue it even beyond one year as dual antiplatelet therapy. So prepare the lesion very well size appropriately, pay attention to expansion limits, and post dilate with a non-compliant balloon. Now I want you to understand that as you get these devices, this is here, is, I hope you can see this clearly, is a stenosis, which is high grade in an OM, uh, on a right angle, the uh, takeoff of a circumflex, which has two curves on it, and there's some calcification. After having done a pre-dilatation of this lesion with a 2.5 at 20 atmospheres, what I want you to note in this is this curve. You can never dot up this device. This, this device is plastic. And sustained pressure on this device, sustained pressure 
over uh, what is here in all star wire will gradually take this down as is seen in this this image here it gradually gradually pushes it down without doitering be patient sustain push and then it gradually comes down into position and here it is implanted giving a good result so you can actually get these devices on but you got to be patient and sustain well i told you that uh, uh, eyeballing has a very variable result in a 3 mm vessel you can actually be talking about 2.7 to a 3.3 but oct gives you accurate results i was mis slightly overestimated so the lesson is that if you have uh, assess a uh, vessel angiographically to be a 3 3 then you can be sure it's a 3.25 to a 3.5 so i would if if i if i was sure that it was a 3.25 i would implant a 3.5 scaffold and go up with a 3.5 at high pressures if it was a 3 i'd take it up 3.25 take it up and maybe even a 3.5 uh, balloon to a high pressures well i this is almost like 20 years ago deja vu high pressure drill is what we learned 20 years ago when the first metallic stents came out uh, and, and this is no different to that. It's back to the basics. This is how we should do things. And I just want to illustrate to you this important point in the techniques. In this editorial where I demonstrated that you have this 2.5 millimeter LED, which I have pre-dilated with a 2.5 millimeter balloon to uh, 20 atmospheres. The pre-dilatation is adequate, as you can actually see in, in this view here. And then this is a 2.5 into 28. <laughs> BVS de deployed at 14 atmospheres being a 2.9 millimeters in terms of diameter. I then post dilated with a 2.75 millimeter balloon to 22 atmospheres and the final size achieved is 2.93, not very different from the 2.9 which was achieved by the stent implantation balloon itself. But what we see different on the, on the OCT images is that while the implantation had malopposed struts. These struts are now well opposed in the same point, even though the final balloon size was very similar in a compliant balloon versus a non-compliant balloon. There were under, under expanded areas of the scaffold with an area of 4.61 millimeters, which have increased to 5.74 millimeters, nearly a 20% increase, again by using a non-compliant versus balloon compared to a compliant balloon, even though the final sizing was the same. But more importantly, we've been able to embed struts. Here you see struts actually being standing out on the surface of this vessel. And here you have actually embedded struts, which are nearly a third embedded into the vessel wall, almost making a 150 micron scaffold into a 100 micron scaffold. So again, the principles get very important in terms of a post dilatation with a non-compliant -com quarter size to a half size higher balloon to at least 18 to 20 atmospheres. And that may actually help you to understand that you may not need to image all your scaffolds uh, and, and therefore optimize results and post dil as needed because if you post dilate all at high pressures with my philosophy, then you only end up imaging a few because you actually have achieved the final results. Uh, just uh, how much time more do I have, uh, Manish? No, you keep going. You have another few minutes. You're doing, uh, this has been very okay. useful. Okay, that because I, I wanted to, uh, the, I just wanted to show you not the case itself, but the technique here. Here is a totally occluded anterior arising our right coronary artery, which when opened is diffusely diseased right up to these, this PDA, but the PDA is long. If you see in the other view, the PDA actually supplies a very large area up to the apex of the LV. And therefore, this requires a BVS. A full metal jacket would be horrific in such a situation now in the presence of BVS. And therefore, pre dilatation with high pressure, 2.5, 3, and 3.5 millimeter balloons all across the way. Even though the distal vessel looks small, uh, this has already got, you can see that we've got a guide, but we've got a buddy wire up front, an All Star and a, and a, and a BMW. This helps the device to go down, as you can see, into the small PDA, and that PDA is no more than a 2.25 visually, which makes me feel that it's a 2.5 millimeter vessel, and I therefore implant this absorb and go up to 22 atmospheres with a 2.5 millimeter balloon. I then bring a second scaffold down, and here I will actually have to tell you 
This is a marker to marker overlap, and I'm going to tell you how to overlap these vessels. I no more do marker to marker. I do now marker before the scaffold marker, and this is what I've got implant. But I want to also show you this. When I've taken one of the wires out, and I'm implanting this proximal device, look at the fact that I do have a problem getting this device at, across this slight calcified uh, bend, which was easy when I, had, when I had a buddy wire. But then I finally get these scaffolds on, and after five scaffolds and 13 centimeters of a coverage, dilated up from 2.5 at high pressures to four millimeters at high pressures, we actually have what looks like a neat vessel. Uh, yeah, let me see. That looks like a very neat vessel, uh, very good vessel. Uh, 13 millimeters, 13 centimeters of scaffold, five scaffolds, a full plastic jacket. But what is interesting is that a three-year follow-up, this vessel looks good. Vessel looks like larger. Vessel, vessel looks enlarged. And this is why I would say that this is endoluminal reconstruction. By this time, the imaging actually, the scaffolds are still there. Another year or two, the scaffolds would have disappeared. And I believe that that's why I believe that it's absolutely worth it. Even if it had been metallic jacket, I would be still worried at three years because increasingly this guy would have been faced with cardiac event rates increasingly every year with a full metal jacket. So when I say marker to marker, I think I want to demonstrate this. When we put overlap scaffolds, one can actually put the distal balloon, the balloon marker over the distal scaffold marker like this. And when we do this, we get a millimeter of an overlap or less than a millimeter overlap. But in smaller vessels, I would now bring this, this, this marker, I would bring this marker now to not on the distal scaffold marker, but just before the distal scaffold marker. If I bring it just before the distal scaffold marker, then I would actually have edge-to-edge -edge overlap, which is more useful in smaller vessels. Because if you understand 150 micron overlap, even if it is a millimeter, actually means 600 microns, 0.6 millimeter circumferentially. And we know that there's delayed endothelialization in such instances um, and, and could predispose to scaffold thrombosis in smaller vessels. OK, just a bit of word about bifurcations. One of my favorites, I must say, I actually do treat bifurcations, and, and much of the philosophy and much of the strategy is the same as, as, uh, as a metal device. Uh, provisional strategy in most instances, though occasionally we have to end up with a, a, a planned two scaffold strategy, and the provisional is straightforward. Why protect the side branch uh, the, if, and, and st scaffold the main branch? If there's a patent side branch at the end and Timmy 3 flow, and it's a moderate side branch, one can just withdraw the jail wire. And of course, if there's significant pinching of the side branch, one can do a pot to the main branch scaffold and cross the wire through the BVS into the side branch. One can ease open the struts slowly, again, two atmospheres every five minutes with a two or a 2.5 millimeter balloon with a sequential graduation without disrupting the device and do what we call a final snuggle uh, to maintain the side branch patency. This final snuggle, by the way, is not a kiss. Uh, I want to, to tell you that uh, this was the technique that we first described ever when we first described the first ever case reports of a two scaffold strategy using tap technique. And we described this, uh, this uh, snuggle technique. Uh, the snuggle balloon dilatation is what this is where you actually do not bring the side branch uh, uh, balloon well into the main branch and do a kiss. You just leave it mildly or shortly protruding, almost like a mini, a mini protrusion into the main branch. And we call it a snuggle. And the reason we call it a snuggle is because it's at low pressures, is to lie and curl up closely and comfortably together, as is seen here. And it's lovely to see the balloons do a snuggle rather than the vicious, voracious uh, French kiss. So we do not recommend the kissing balloon at all. And we can dilate these, we, we, we can dilate these uh, struts. Uh, uh, and this is, this is perhaps the most illustrative uh, uh, message that I can give about dilatation through the struts of the device. If one is doing only a three millimeter balloon, it's a three millimeter scaffold, then you can actually put a three millimeter balloon through the struts of the main, main brown scaffold and gradually go up to 10 atmospheres, which is the safe threshold. Beyond this, there's going to be device disruption. But if we have a, 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 a snuggle, 
uh, where there is a three millimeter main uh, balloon in the main branch, then one should only take a 2.5 millimeter balloon in the side branch through the struts can be taken up to seven to 10 atmospheres, but a three millimeter balloon should only be taken to five atmospheres, uh, otherwise there'd be risk of disruption. So let me just show you, and I think this would be my last slide if you permit, is these two scaffold strategies as we define them. And we've now got two scaffold strategies in close to 40 patients, which is being written up, and you'll soon see, see it in, in the press, in, in the publication. Uh, we, we started off as a salvage for these two scaffold strategies doing micro taps. Here's the main branch scaffold um, as in, in this large OM. And we, this is, we see that the side branch, which is the AV group circumflex is closing. We then dilated it uh, through the struts of the OM scaffold. And then we passed another scaffold through the struts, did a micro tap as is seen here, as is seen in this, uh, with very little protrusion of the side branch scaffold into the main branch, getting a great result. It, this was one of our first cases, but a three-year follow-up of CT on this shows maintained patency of this micro-tap technique. We therefore moved on to more elective strategies, and you can see some highly horrific complex cases, as is seen here. This, this, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, is, uh, uh, let me just get to this uh, much more, uh, uh, um, I don't know why this is uh, coming in like this. Hmm. Anyway, I'm going to take you through another. Okay, okay, I'll show you this. Uh, can I just go uh, escape this for a moment? Uh, just if you give me a minute, because it doesn't show you the complete case, and uh, it won't be. This is the only case that I would actually show you uh, for bifurcation before I come to my conclusion. Uh, Okay, so we have this, uh, this highly complex bifurcation, as you can see here. This guy has also has a right coronary artery stenosis. This is calcified, this is ugly, this is long, and it has got extensive disease down both bifurcations. Well, such calcified lesions require rotational atherectomy in the first instance, as you can see here, LAD being rotoblated, diagonal being rotoblated. Following LAD, we can actually now get the scaffold after high pressure pre-dilatations of this three millimeter vessel by a 2.75 to 20 atmosphere. We have the first scaffold down inflated with a 3.3 millimeter balloon to 22 atmospheres. And then we have a 3.5 millimeter scaffold again inflated with a 3.5 at, at high pressures. And then the proximal part of it was inflated with a 3.75. Having, having done that, we then move on to my next set of slides, which is here. Having done that, we now dilate the side branch of the main branch scaffold and pass a 2.5 into 8 millimeter scaffold through the side branch. And you can see that beautifully coming through. It goes easily and smoothly through most instances. And this is how we actually implant these side branch scaffolds with the marker of the balloon just inside the ostium. And the marker of the scaffold is at the ostium therefore assuring me that I have less than a one millimeter carina being, being actually built up and with a good coverage. Having done this, we actually inflate the balloon, do high pressure dilatations on the side branch and then do a final snuggle, as you can see here. And this is what we see as a final result. This patient does, has a pot to it. Having seen that, I felt that the distal diagonal was not so good, it had dissected and therefore I needed to salvage the distal diagonal. So here is a scaffold, not just going through the main branch scaffold, but also going through the side branch scaffold more distally, crossing through, through two struts, and then being implanted distally again at high pressures, giving this as a final result. And this is what you see now, quite neat looking artery, which was earlier badly calcified, horrific looking bifurcation. And, and the OCT images are amazing because they show a nice micro carina, which, which I won't waste your time on, but you can see it here, good apposition at, at, uh, and, and good opening of the side branch here. 
and then and then the RCA was also scaffolded uh, by by 3.5 into 18 dilated to four. Uh, and are at six months' time, and this patient is now gone for a year being asymptomatic, you have complete patency of this bifurcation and all these vessels. So I think that we've got to move on to say that uh, we need better devices. We can do very complex uh, cases with this device. Yes, we need to understand it. But the 100 is certainly a clear, uh, clear advantage over the, the 155 micron device, which is absorbed. The meters 100 has got reduced strength thickness. It has a large size matrix. The cells can be opened up much larger. It's an innovative device with, uh, with open cells at the center, closed cells at the edge, edges. It comes in a variety of sizes. We can perhaps expand it more. And so we're re looking really at the next generation of BRS with, uh, with greater opacity with three markers. These are very fascinating. It certainly gives you a three-dimensional uh, aspect that you really have a device there. And we have a couple of advantages here. So we have the Miras program going, and I'm very proud that there is an Indian company standing out in the rest of the world, bringing in such innovative technology. And you're lucky to be on the Miras site uh, to actually see some of these fascinating technologies being uh, being developed from India itself. Uh, and, and I therefore actually commend the fact that I was privileged to be the first, uh, the principal investigator of the first in-man study. Uh, of the Miras 100 device. Uh, the 108 patients have been finished at multiple clinical sites across this country, and I thank all the investigators for having contributed to finishing this study immaculately without any acute com complications or thrombosis of this device. Uh, these are the enrollers into this, uh, uh, this uh, Miras 1 study, and I thank them for, for actually having been so sincere about this effort. And, and the results of this, by the way, uh, we hope that we will have the data by September to be able to present the results at the TCT this year. But uh, uh, let's hope that uh, we have a new generation of scaffold right there in our hands uh, by next year's time if all goes well and uh, if the results look good. So my final slide would tell you that please remember that BRS is like a first generation metallic stent. It's therefore back to the basics of good employment, good optimal employment uh, deployment techniques. It requires meticulous attention uh, to implantation techniques, including high pressure post dilatation and result optimization. It requires meticulous attention to your antiplatelet regimen and anticoagulation regimen. And it requires clear understanding of tips and tricks for complex lesion anatomy to have a successful result similar to the best in class metallic drug eluting stents. Thank you very much for your attention. Ashok, that was absolutely brilliant overview of uh, new technology. You know, we've had it in the United States now for about four weeks, Absorb. Uh, they've only, uh, yes. Abbott has only uh, opened up 12 sites. Uh, as a collective a group, we've maybe in, uh, implanted uh, two dozen or so. Uh, the one thing that strikes me, and I want you to comment uh, as an early adopter of BVS, uh, the current generation Abbott product and its overlap uh, uh, markers are very, very challenging to see. At least when you're used to putting in, you know, full metal jackets, uh, this becomes much more meticulous to overlap. W what are the tips and tricks you, you can share with us about that? Because this technology I find very challenging to overlap. You're, you're so right. and and and. and it, you invariably end up either, uh, they, they sometimes don't get seen on a fluoro, and you end up uh, cine, or you end up uh, on your stent boost. Yes. Uh, this, this quite clear that, that uh, stent boost does show these up very well. So, so you, you, you would be uh, okay to use stent boost regularly for these devices. Okay. Uh, must also remember that the markers, being, there's only one marker. Uh, well, there are two markers, but they're only one side. Right. And therefore, you might actually... Uh, you actually have to turn your, your uh, camera to another direction so that you can actually see it on the side because sometimes it just starts overlapping your wire and therefore you're again not being able to see that very clearly. Right. You only see it, see it if it's in a profile uh, rather than, than uh, on the wire itself. The, the third aspect is that there's a parallax uh, because it's a single marker. 
So you actually have to be very sure that you're actually perpendicular to the device, otherwise you can be beyond the marker with your balloon or even miss the marker or be before the marker. Right. Uh, which is not so bad, but it's, it's a good idea to see it in two directions to be sure that you're actually abutting it. And, and fourthly, you sometimes see it better if you've expanded your scaffold, if you've expanded your balloon, and then you see the marker next to your balloon rather than, than otherwise. So yes, and that's where Miras has done a great job. Yes. Uh, those markers are so clear, and because there are multiple, you actually almost get the three-dimensional view that you're actually sitting inside a scaffold, even though you don't see the scaffold. So I think that we certainly, the next generation, would actually have, have better uh, markers, or at least two markers, that you don't have to keep moving your imaging. And, and I, I'm, I'm certainly telling you one more thing, that most of the companies, uh, the, even the, 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 the uh, imaging, uh, uh, the cath lab companies are coming out with softwares which would make us more easy to see these devices uh, in, the, in the new cath labs. Wonderful. Any questions from the audience? He's been discussing that with me. Yeah. I'm yeah. a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, we have a question from the audience uh, in there. I'm expecting the, this uh, new generation BVS, a special material 100, especially for it's since taught about maybe 100 micro. Yes. And uh, it's a thinner than the previous uh, first generation BVS. So would you can recommend uh, maybe this, the, this since taught will in affect future stent thrombosis as compared to previous or first generation BBS. So Shok, the question is, is the 100 micron so, uh, uh, Mirez going to translate to lower stent thrombosis than the 150 micron product? The, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, re remains to be seen. It's a it's truly logical conclusion that we know. That's why the thin strut devices came in. Um, and, and there's no question in my mind that it endothelializes later. Uh, that uh, and the thick struts do endothelialize later uh, as compared to thin strut devices. I do believe that that could be one of the ways to look at uh, the advantages of a 100 micron BVS. Uh, uh, so, so I'm encouraged by the fact that yes, that some of these high pressure techniques that we're doing, um, some of these meticulous uh, uh, extreme uh, 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 pre dilatation and post dilatation. Uh, we're doing may not be required, but it's too early to say those sort of things. We better follow the principles as we've learned with the thick strut plastic device. What is re what's also important is that the pre-dilatation would still remain, and I can tell you that because of the fact that uh, as we go down on the th thickness of the device, we have a concern in real life about losing the radial strength. After all, no question, these are plastic devices, and even though on bench testing and in vitro, we can demonstrate them to be as good as Zion's. I don't believe that in real life, with large bulky plaques, that they would be as good as metallic stents. So we certainly have that recoil there. We certainly do look, see recoil in the 100 microns and sometimes even the 150 micron devices. And we therefore have to have the principles correct of doing whatever we have. Only time will tell us whether we can actually relax on these especially as we grow into these 100 micron devices. But I must warn you that, that as we, these are not simple stuff. As we go on to more complex uh, uh, lesion subsets, uh, it, it even becomes more challenging. And hopefully, these 100 micron devices will allow us to do even more challenging lesion subsets more easily. But I don't think we will give up the tips and tricks that we've learned at the present moment for quite some time. Thank you very much, Ashok. That was very clear. Appreciate the time you spent this afternoon with us. Have a good afternoon. We're going to move on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manish, and I look forward to seeing you, seeing you tomorrow in Delhi. I think you're yes. going to be in Delhi tomorrow, day after. Yes. Look forward to seeing you there. Absolutely. We'll we'll see you then. Hopefully, we'll make it up there. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to uh, finish you, our thank day. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye. With uh, um, the last.